Hey, uh, how do I pronounce your first name? Is it Mate? Mate. Mate. Beautiful. Okay. Have Have you ever met a Jethro before? If I ever. Have you ever met someone? I ever met a Jethro before. Hmm. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Why? But, Is it not very common? No. No, no. It's... I've never met anyone called my name, and I haven't met anyone who's met someone with my name yet. Oh. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. It doesn't seem weird at all to me because I'm not a native speaker. That's interesting. So to me, it's so, a name. Yeah. I've, I've, I've bounced, bounced into uh, some pretty weird names before, but yours is definitely not on that list. <laughs> oh, wow. That's good. <laughs> It must just be, yeah, this must be Australian thing. Um, firstly, thanks, mate. I really appreciate your time, by the way. Very, um, yeah, very, very cool to speak with you. Um, well, why don't we start? Is that okay? Yes. Beautiful. Um, Matej, where are you? Are you in your house? Uh, no, I'm actually in Slovenia visiting my kids. Uh, not too long before I go back to Monaco for some more warm temperatures uh, to get back into training routine. I didn't know you had kids. I have two kids, yes. And what, what are their names? Uh, the older one is called Julia. She's three and a half. And the younger one is called Oliver. Uh, he's one and a half. Wow. Have, have uh, Has Oliver and Julia ever uh, been to one of your races at the end? Uh not really. Julia was at Tour of Slovenia one time. Yeah. And that ended up very bad. Uh, oh. I took her to, to the sign on. And uh, on the way back, we tripped and fell. And she cut her uh, cheek, no. actually. And she had to get stitches. So my heart was uh, oh. cutting for the weeks afterwards. Yeah. Uh, now it's okay because you can't see the scar is almost invisible now but uh, it was pretty bad at the time so it doesn't bring good luck to, <laughs> to have them visit uh, races when when you first became a um, a father did you find yourself um, being a bit more cautious when you in races following that time because I've heard that from other cyclists before uh, I was always cautious in racing yeah. doesn't look like that, but uh, in my mind, I always uh, pay a lot of attention. So the, the the first thing that I try to pursue is not to crash. Always. Has always <laughs> been like that. Will yeah. always stay like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I need to touch wood now, but I don't crash that often yes. anymore because yeah. of my own mistakes. Um, my teammates are <laughs> Or should we make fun of me because of saying this? They always do, <laughs> um, but it's uh, yeah. I don't. I don't feel like I take any risks usually in racing, mm. uh, except a few uh, exceptions uh, here and there. But um, yeah, I always try to stay within my limits. Mm. I remember. Um, well, actually, that makes me think of a question. Um, for average cyclists, just average Joes like me and most of the people listening, descending, I think, is one of the things that uh, it's hard for people to get right. And maybe it's because we don't, maybe we're not, we don't, we're not having to descend at speed. So perhaps uh, it's a bit difficult. It's when we do corner at speed, we don't quite get it. So I wondered when you're out there training and practicing your descending um, or just any cornering at high speeds, What's the main sort of thing that you're always like, like you're always looking to do? Are you focusing on, you know, the exit of the corner? Are you thinking about how your weight's positioned, or is it just a natural thing for you? There's many things. The main thing is not to crash. I think about not crashing. <laughs> I always have that in front of my mind. I always um, imagine there's a big truck coming the other way uh, in a blind corner or. Uh, Stuff like that. I always uh, try to um, foresee what's what can potentially go wrong. Oh. But uh, to yeah, on top of that, so the second thing on my list is uh, to take the the 
the right line through the corner. That's yeah. probably the most important thing. Yeah. So I try to give myself as much space as I can to take the corner as wide as I can and kind of hit the apex late if possible mm. and then come out on the other side also wide. as far as wide as I can yeah to use them as much out as I can yeah. and uh, that it makes sense also in open traffic you you don't I don't I would never cut the corner I would never I would always stay on the far far right side of the road even I would not even go and try to hit the apex not even of my own lane because there's always people that can come uh, the opposite direction that can take more than their own lane no if they have wide vehicles or whatever then you always need to to foresee that because still we don't we are not inside a car with six airbags no it's yeah. just us and the bike so uh, you need to make sure you don't make you don't put yourself in danger no but Obviously, um, having grown up in Slovenia, we have so many small and twisty and very technical roads uh, that I grew up on cycling for so many years that you get better or really good at uh, predicting uh, the traffic around you or what others do and also the corners and the surfaces. Because I probably, in each training ride, every 30 seconds in the technical bits, I do a corner. No? And in some, if I go to Spain to training camp, then I do 12 corners in the whole day, or I don't know, uh, not that many, you know? It, yeah. There's a huge difference yeah. in, uh, in how many or how tricky a parkour is. And if you go to US, then you do four corners, you know? It's not <laughs> yeah. like, uh, four corners on a highway. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so there is definitely a difference to that. And then, yeah, if you take the right racing line, um, you basically did 80% of what you need to go fast and efficient and safe also. Yeah. And then uh, building on top of that, I also now subconsciously um, make sure that I lean the bike in the right way. I apply pressure to the, to the pedal on the outside to make the center of gravity lower. Uh, if I go full, guys, I even pull on the pedal on the inside. Really? So I do the push down power on the outside and pull up as much as I can on the inside. And that makes the bike very stable when you lean it. And I only lean the bike. I don't, I try to not lean myself at all. Yeah. So I apply pressure, so to say, at vertically or 90, 90 degrees on the on the bicycle. Yeah. Try to put, put as much pressure down as I can and... Uh, keep myself stable on almost on top of the bike. It's exactly the opposite of what the motorcycle riders do yeah. because there the motorcycle uh, is the by, by far the heavier part of the system. And on your bicycle, uh, you are much more heavy than your bicycle. No? So you do the opposite of what they do. Mm, and, uh, good point. and I try to also use my sight. You always need to look uh to a point that is the furthest point that you can see at that moment mm -hmm. so you always you don't look in directly in front of you you look as far ahead as the road you can see uh, mm -hmm. by, so to say and when you when you recognize that there's no danger or you know which line you're gonna take then you look closer in front of you and you switch that view uh probably m more times each second to assess the the line and like directly what's happening directly in front of you and also where you will go in a couple of moments time so mm -hmm. it's quite a it's a process and i think doing more of it you get better at it and for sure my normal is probably crazy fast for most people i think yeah like even in the car or uh, driving normally i probably have a different uh, yeah, different. Uh, I perceive what's normal differently uh, yes. to other people, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's just from practicing, I think, or yeah. from growing up in that way, also. Yeah, it's a good point about where you ride too, having lots of corners to navigate just on a normal training ride versus yeah, other countries. Um, I always found it weird. I, I've seen lots of videos in Europe of other pros out training on the hills and stuff, and like I would see them. They might have a GoPro on them or something like that. And I often see them taking both sides of the 
lanes, you know, like both sides on open roads and, um, you know, cars could be coming other way. And I'm in Australia, I would, we would never do that. Um, really <laughs> strange. And it makes me think of those videos. I don't know if you've seen on YouTube, but the um, that guy called Saffa Brian, he does those ascending videos. Okay. And um, he did one. Basically, he his YouTube channel is just him fully sending to downhills, like crazy downhills. And he just has cameras on him. He got Tom. He got Tom Peacock to do one with him once, and Tom almost crashed. He almost lost his, you know, his rear wheel. And um, yeah, you like them. They're really something. But he takes a lot of risk. Yeah, Saffa Brian called. He's called. Uh, I think he calls himself like Pray for Speed. <laughs> okay, I will. I will check him out. But you uh, like yeah. it, mate. and it's really. I don't think that's that's something that uh, you want to. I don't know. Maybe it's nice to watch. I, I don't. I personally wouldn't take a risk to uh, to shoot videos. The, the <laughs> I take plenty of risk in racing sometimes, and I don't really like it. I like to go fast, but not yeah. uncomfortably fast. Yeah, How I you... love to go fast actually, but yeah, comfortably fast. You know, How comfortably fast, and everybody's comfortable is different. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah, your you, your Milan San Remo win that was one of my favourites of yours, and just one of the great cycling moments. But I wondered, do you ever rewatch the video of you descending? Uh, not personally, no. But they make me rewatch it at events oh, yeah. uh, often. So yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it uh, against your a will. Of times. Yeah. Um, okay. So one thing I wanted to know is. Uh, one of the reasons why I really, um, yeah, I like you as a cyclist and a, and a uh, and a person of how you come across in the media, Matt, is is you're always so open with your interviews after races, before races, um, you know, on podcasts like this. And I wondered why do you think you are that way? Why are you such a uh, you know conversationalist and so open about your you know how you're feeling and and your thoughts and stuff? Why do you think you are that way? I don't know. It's uh, probably um, the kind of person I am, uh, the kind of person my parents uh, yeah, raised me uh, to, to become. Um, I might be... It's not always easy for us um, to express yeah. what we feel and uh, what we want to say in a foreign language, uh, English not being first language of most riders. But, uh, yeah, Slovenia is not a big country, so we end up using English most of the time oh, to wow. do anything on the internet or uh, watch movies or read books. So, um, yeah, I uh, got pretty comfortable with it over time. And, um, yeah, it's not too difficult for me to, to, to speak in English or uh, Italian or uh, some other foreign languages now. So that makes uh, makes it a little bit easier, but yeah, probably also the the type of person you are, or uh, yeah, the intellect you have. Um, yes. I don't know. I was always uh, enjoying myself when I had to go to school to to listen to the lessons or to learn anything new. So that probably also helps. If you're more of an introvert, then uh, makes it more difficult to to say to others what you feel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Matt, I'd love to get the audience to know more about you, and you're doing that already. You're doing a great job. And I wondered, in your off-season, which you might be sort of in now, maybe starting to get back on the bike again, I'm not sure, but what do you like to do in your off-season when you're just at home? I've, of course, seeing your, your kids and your family, but is there any types of, you know, do you do other hobbies? Do you go fishing? Do you, I don't know. Do you do boxing? I don't know. Puzzles? Lego? What do you like to do? <laughs> <to switch off? laughs> so, uh, the off-season, yeah, the famous off-season. I'm not a big off-season guy. Like, it's not... Oh. Uh, I'm not the guy that waits uh, the whole last part of the season for the off-season to start and then go drinking and eating oh, yeah. uh, in all you can eat buffet. I'm yeah. exactly the opposite. I would yeah. probably perceive... A healthy lifestyle if I had a, an office job. Mm. So uh, I'm also very passionate about cycling in private life. Uh, cycling is and always will be my my biggest hobby, and uh, I would most likely go cycling every day after uh, after a job if I had if I 
did something else for a living. Yeah. And uh, being um, quite successful, especially after this season, has been uh, my most successful season so far. Um, I was actually lucky for the first time in a couple of years to not be injured or seriously sick in the yes. during the off season but uh, I've had uh, many many things to do uh, we are almost never um, home uh, I'm also almost never in Slovenia so um, tasks start to accumulate and you make a list and then you try to check <laughs> out a part of that list during the off season when you are supposed to have more time but uh-huh. uh, especially this year I had literally zero free time so far yeah uh, because I do book um, a significant part of each day uh, to spend with my kids now that I can yeah uh, because there's not many days in a year when I can so um, yeah it's a little bit tricky uh, I wouldn't say that I like to complain about it but uh, it's just the way it is um, but I don't mind to go uh yeah back to my more regular routine of training and resting and having or taking some free time for myself um each day no yeah. to relax and to chill because yeah it's been a really busy uh past couple of weeks for me uh also because we work hard to get ready for next season to plan to explore the 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 details that we want to make better and it's all hard work nothing comes for free and if you just uh chill for whatever five weeks or six weeks and then come to the first training camp and you haven't been to a wind tunnel you haven't uh discussed uh what you want to change on your bike and so on then yeah you're probably not in the same uh level uh, than the ones who did so uh mm-hmm. yeah then okay. it's not fair to complain afterwards that the other are faster if you didn't do your homework so uh yeah it's just the way it is and uh from the training standpoint of view i always like to uh take some time for uh for myself from the last race to the first training camp so in this year it was from 15th of october to basically 5th of december i take all this time yeah evenly i don't really uh do three weeks off bike or uh not doing any sports like some people i prefer to take myself more time uh so i treat all this period of whatever six seven weeks and uh, just pursue a healthy lifestyle routine i try to squeeze in a sports activity um, on most days uh, even if it's just 20 minutes running or one hour on home trainer yeah or sometimes i do a longer ride if the weather is nice and i have time uh, but yeah as i as i said i, I was quite busy this year so <laughs> I struggled a little bit, but I still got uh, around 10 to 12 hours uh, training in in every week. So uh, that's pretty, uh, yeah, on point for what I want to do. Okay. Okay. All right. So you love it. That's really good to know. Um, when I, well, one thing I'd love to talk about is the World Championships um, of Gravel. Now, Mate, in Australia, um, I commentate all of our big Australian gravel races uh, and some other road and, and cyclocross. But we have two UCI World Series qualifiers here in Australia. Now, one's on the western side, so Western Australia, called Seven, and uh, there's another one called Gravelista, which is on the east coast. Now, Seven in 2026... Um, where I live, it's called in Western Australia, that's going to be the world champs. So um, we'll talk about that in a moment. But the gravel world champs, how would you, how would you describe the course because and, and the, the terrain that you were racing on when you won? Because the second year that they've had the world championships, I felt was the real world championships. The first year, I don't think yeah. they got the... Yeah, they didn't quite get it, 
But the second year, it seemed to me like that was proper gravel. So I'm not probably the best person to ask because this was my first ever gravel race. Yeah. But what was your first I, impression? Uh, yeah, yes. But, but I did ride a lot of gravel before. And uh, also, I'm quite comfortable on my mountain bike. Oh, yeah. And uh, that sort of stuff. I ride sometimes with the guys who, who do enduro or not downhill, but yeah, enduro or uh, or mountain bike. Yeah. So um, I would personally say that the, that this course was definitely reflecting the spirit of gravel. Um, on paper, there might have been quite a few kilometers of asphalt, but that didn't make any harm to the fact that in my opinion the course was uh, a proper hard mm. day of graveling so to say because the asphalt parts was just were just there to connect different yes very beautiful trails and sections of yeah gravel um and on in those 170 kilometers i think um there was just maybe around 15 kilometers where it was better to draft, so to stay oh, yeah. in third, fourth, or fifth wheel, or even further back. Uh, and all the rest, even the parts on asphalt, was either climbing on a very steep climbs, right, or uh, descending, or uh, just so technical that you more more efficient sitting on the front than yeah. uh, drafting. Uh, actually, some of the easier sections of the course where you could eat something and assess the situation were on gravel. Uh, most of the asphalt sections, except for the one straight on from the start, there was like five or six kilometers mm. on a proper big road. Right. Uh, in a run into a very tricky section of of gravel where you basically crossed a river yeah uh and that was super uh nasty with big big rocks and uh super soft terrain where you basically dived in with your bicycle it was not yeah. compact and i thought that was really good to have that section of asphalt of five or six k because then everyone that didn't have the best grid position yeah would uh, make their way back to the front. Mm. Um, and I think this is good for the sport to allow everyone to, to to fight and get in position before the real nasty part of the course started. And then moving from there on, there was not a lot of time to actually um, to actually uh, yeah um, sit on the wheel and rest. Uh, yeah. I think the rest of the course was pretty technical. At parts, even like probably better suited to, uh, probably even better suited to, um, to a mountain bike. Yes, really. Uh, yeah, I think so. Like some of the descents were pretty, pretty technical with big rocks and uh, roots and all that sort of stuff. Wow. So yeah. Okay, and. That first, like the first half an hour looked absolutely hectic because there was a rider, one of the US guys, Payson McLavin, I think is how you say it. He uploaded a really cool video um, of his un onboard GoPro from that first half an hour. And it, he was coming from the back and it looked absolutely crazy. Um, that first half an hour, were you, <laughs> where were you in the first half an hour? You must have been near the front, surely. Uh, so I had starting position three uh, oh. because I, had, I was the third best ranked guy because they took the UCI rankings of all the disciplines. So yeah. any discipline you competed in, they took the ranking and they basically halved the points that you accumulated, oh. except for the gravel ranking, they kept all the points. I see. Uh, so I ended up being the third most awarded rider in the start on the start list wow. so i started from the front but uh obviously i uh, yeah it wasn't that big of a difference um because of that huge section of 
the big roads yeah. uh, coming into the, the river crossing. Mm. But I imagine if you didn't, um, if you were not in position there, which probably happened to to that guy, then yeah. that was a big ask to yeah. to get back to the to the front because yeah, uh, actually like to to do a move on on that big road, it's more of a road racer kind of thing. Yes. Uh, so yeah. It's not easy because it's the speeds are even if you're on gravel bikes, the speeds are pretty high and it's pretty it gets pretty nasty and mm. yeah, there's some probably pushing and shouldering involved. So it's not easy. But yeah, if you were not in front at that point, I think like my teammates started at the far back because they had basically zero points. Yeah, yeah. They still got to the front like in two minutes. They were both there, mm. and some other guys from from the back. Um, uh so um what's the name of um the american who won the unbound uh, uh oh yeah, what Keegan. I, yeah Keegan, he 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 got he got to the front in like two three minutes he was already there and yeah yeah he, he was very handy and strong but if you didn't get into position when you had to yeah you're gone uh, <laughs> that makes things very complicated yeah. and i did actually after that river crossing um lose focus for a little bit or I didn't know the course into enough detail to know that I have to um, make sure that I stay in top 10 or whatever. And I briefly went back to like 40th or 50th on a section where I where it would probably be better if I if I invested more energy to be in front. And then, yeah, I had to really uh, make some, uh, some risky moves to yeah. get back. Uh, to the front uh, <laughs> yeah i enjoyed that bit I, i'm sorry that they didn't show it on television i think it would be more uh yeah better to see or more attractive to see than than the actual final where they probably had too few motorbikes to yes. to show most groups anyways uh, i think the footage this was okay but it only showed more or less the, the first three groups uh or in the final the first three riders because we split up Mm. But I think uh, the footage of a gravel race can get really, really good quite soon. I we think we have the technology with the drones and uh, yes. motorbikes and helicopters. So I think it will be like in a couple of years, I, I feel as if this discipline is going to really explode and uh, be very become very popular. I agree. I agree. I agree. And the the coverage at at this race where I where I am um, seven, which which is the world champs in twenty twenty six, we're We've got we've been trialing many different ways on how to broadcast our race, and um, I'll I'll have to send you the YouTube video of our race because we we at the moment what we've been doing and um, building up is we actually have a you know like a, imagine like a golf cart but like a four x four off road golf cart, and um, we follow in front of the race and then in the back of the golf cart there's like a tray. And we sit in that tray and we film and try and live stream the race as it's happening in front of us and uh, so ahead of the race. And because of the seven course, it's quite climby. It's very – there's lots of elevation. Um, It means we can be in front of the group and not really disturb the race too much, you know, versus if it was a flat race, you you might be contributing to drafting, that sort of stuff. And then when it's when it's the descents, we get out of the way and get in behind them and then come back around at other points. But getting the coverage right is difficult because often where the courses go, there's poor reception. So we're yeah, that's one of the challenges we're working on at the moment is how to get it perfect. And we're using Starlink, you know, putting Starlink um, you know the, the internet things out on course, and it's yeah, it's going to be interesting. But I agree with you. I think it's going to be crazy, and I reckon drones are the future. Hey, like what they um, have you seen them use the drones in cyclocross? Yeah, but that's different because you basically are only covering an area of not even one square kilometer, and here you probably travel from A to B, which makes mm. things a lot more complicated. I think mm. maybe helicopters is the answer. I mean, helicopter for sure, uh, like in road racing. Uh, yeah. uh, it's just, uh, you could probably have the drones for the most attractive parts of the course where you might not necessarily be able to follow yeah. with a quad or a motorbike. Uh, they had a really good um, 
idea of bringing enduro riders on enduro motorbikes uh, in gravel world championships. So one was following me with a GoPro that was somehow connected to probably 3G network, yeah. and that also worked really well. So uh, I think that's also mm. an option. But you need to have a coverage of the signal, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah, or someone on like an e-bike, like an e-mount bike. That would definitely mm. work. Uh, yeah, well, uh, this is one thing that I'm always interested about is, is the do you think the World Championships for gravel is long enough in terms of distance? I think, I don't know, depending on what people think is the spirit of gravel. Uh, Unbound and those other events are definitely longer, mm. but uh, Gravel World Championships was the hardest activity I've done this year. Really? So, yeah, yeah, it's harder than uh, Lombardy or, uh, or um, what else, like right. harder than Flanders or Roubaix or all those races. Yeah, it was 6,000 kilojoules. Wow, was it 6,000? Yeah, yeah, uh, around 6,000, maybe a little bit more than that in and five hours. One for one, yeah, in five hours. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. There was like a... some of those places they get close to that, but I've never passed 6,000 kilojoules in a road race before. My teammates have had, but they are less efficient than me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, so uh, in a road racing, there's a bigger difference in how much energy you spend. If you're not very good at hiding in the peloton, you spend more. Uh -huh. Here, there's less, less of a difference because there's less draft, drafting in general, so it's mm. more like a marathon run. Like mm. you can be with someone, but that doesn't necessarily make a difference if the terrain is very hilly and technical. Mm. Mm. So. When uh, in the lead up to the world champs, did you spend a lot of time researching no. and planning for your your bike? Nothing. No, and the bike arrived. The, the frame set arrived on Tuesday uh, because there was some last minute adjustment of the paint job or whatever. I saw like a prototype frame, naked, not painted during the tour, but I didn't build it up. And then uh, I was busy racing a lot in the time after the tour and uh so the bike was basically only ready on like on tuesday evening and i rode it first on wednesday uh for the first time and <laughs> then i traveled on thursday and i rode it in recon on friday and saturday and then i raced on it and then merida <laughs> obviously uh took it to the to the new silex launch for uh, journalists and uh, now they're keeping it for some other uh, exhibition stuff. So I, I don't, I don't currently have it. You like, have it. <laughs> I'm preparing a new, a new uh, bike with uh, with the paint job of the world champion. But yeah, mm. did you? What? Who chose your tire pressures? I chose my tire pressures. I'm really good at that. It's I um, use the same experience I have on the road. Uh, so I went. I decided to go a little bit higher than probably most of the other riders, but I think that was a good call mm. because I was still afraid of the of the big rocks and sharp other sharp uh, objects. Because if you go, yeah, if you go with a with a higher pressure, I think you are less likely to to cut your tire on a mm. on a on a rock or something if you hit something really hard. And I did like two or three times during a race mm. because not always you see it or even the rider in front of you doesn't see it and he doesn't point it out and you you hit something really hard and then if you're a little bit lower on pressure it happens also in paris Roubaix. you can yes. easily like target so much squeeze that you can cut it uh with your rim so it's yeah. not uh, if you have to stop it probably you lose more energy than if you run a little bit higher pressure which probably costs you a little bit of energy on the on the rough terrain but then yeah mm. Who who do you who from the professional road peloton do you not want to ride the world championships in gravel next year? I hope everyone does. Like I hope all the big riders do. I yeah. think it's good for the sport, for the discipline to grow. Yeah, I'm not afraid of even if I don't end up winning. Winning, I prefer to lose against the biggest riders than to win if yeah if they are not there. You know what I mean? Like hmm. it is yeah. the world championships. It's like. The minority of of some gravel racers complaining that there was world tour riders on the start because but i think it's good for the sport because yes. if you are better it was a proper gravel championships this year like not yes. a road course yes so if somebody is better in that than you then like it's the same as mountain bike 
guys complaining that Tom Pitcock is coming to the start of the race. If he's better in mountain biking than you guys, then you guys should probably change something, no? Yeah. yeah. Like it's the World Championships is the biggest race on the calendar. You can't be world champion not being the best at what you do, no? I agree. So yeah, I definitely hope that all of the big names get to the start, that have a chance of... I winning. think after this year, we'll see uh, even way more turn up because it was it was yeah. great this year but i think even more yeah. um which would be really cool uh yeah, oh yes yeah. so um leads me to roubaix that's one of my favorite races to watch and uh i guess it's one of everyone's favorite races to watch but roubaix seems like one to me um Matte, that you can definitely win it does seem like it's in your wheelhouse, but you need a lot to go right, like everyone does. And I wondered, next year, I assume you'll be giving it a crack, but what do you think is the most, what are the most influential pieces of the puzzle when it comes to Roubaix that you need to win? You know, is it all about uh, positioning or is it, Team strength? Is it uh, your equipment? Is it feeding? Um, luck? Like, what are those factors that you, you just need to go right to get to get the victory in that race? Do you think? Uh, every year you have a shot. No, it's a race that has the biggest, the longest list of potential contenders because yeah. it's literally like not everyone can win. Not many people can uh, objectively win Flanders, uh, mm-hmm. but there's quite a long list of people that can, if things go right, if the stars align, win Roubaix, no? Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, many things need to go right. Uh, I personally feel like it's Christmas Day every year uh, on the day of Roubaix. Yeah. Last year, I was fortunate to have two Christmas Days uh, together with World Cham- with Gravel World Championships when I can actually <laughs> uh, yeah, take some <laughs> off-road sections at, at full speed without... Uh, Feeling the pressure of uh, my bosses uh, supervising me and uh, giving me <laughs> full stress in case something goes wrong. Uh, we told you you shouldn't do this. You should take care of yourself. Don't hurt yourself. So yeah, uh, it's uh, it's a special day, and I think the 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 biggest influence in Roubaix now the race has changed in the last couple of years since 2021 that we start using uh, tubular tires or uh, tubeless tires mm. uh, this has made it a lot more controlled so there's less luck involved more technique and more knowledge about pressures and uh, different setups and uh, you can basically be 90 five percent sure you are not going to have a mechanical if you choose the right equipment uh or if you have a mechanical it's your own fault whereas before it was pure luck mm. like it you couldn't do nothing if you hit a rock you you had a puncture and that was it because yeah. you had a snake bite and now snake bites are eliminated unless you ride a super low pressure which you shouldn't do anyways mm. um so yeah i like it a lot more now um it's different and special because there's a lot of drafting involved. So it makes a huge difference uh, between riders. Uh, so the more efficient you are, the less energy you spend. Yeah. And I've been in front of a race before uh, with a teammate finishing, I don't know, 10 minutes behind me. Mm. And him and them having more average power than me, uh, being the same size, more or less. So it wow. makes a huge difference on uh, how efficient you are, how close in a draft you dare to ride uh, during that race, because yeah, uh, <laughs> there's always a risk-reward ratio involved. No? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a lot of things that go into consideration, but obviously... The position in the peloton is the most important when you hit the crucial sectors. If you yes. are five wheels too far back, then your race is done. You are not going to be in the mm. front selection. Mm. And then uh, towards the end of the race, if you do do manage to get yourself in the final out of trouble, then um, yeah, it's just about the legs, unfortunately, for me. Mm. Hmm. Like <laughs> you need to well, be your aerobic <laughs> fitness needs to be 
through the roof. Like you need to yeah. be able to repeat um, sub maximal efforts over and over and over and over again. Like all those sectors are written at probably 90, more than 90% of what you are normally able to do if you go full, full gas in training. So if I can go, if I go full in Armberg, it's about, I don't know how long, like three minutes or something, or even yep. longer. Yep. So I do, if I go full in training, I can do about 500 watts seated. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in the race, you do all of those sectors at like 470 or sometimes at 500. So some, some sectors, you would come to 98% of what you would be able to do if you just did that. Yeah. And you need to do this over and over and over and over again until you die or come to the velodrome. So <laughs> special race, yeah. Oh, it's a special race. Oh, I love yeah. it. We we love watching it here. Um, and it's often at not a bad time for Australia as well. It's not too bad. You can it finishes around twelve o'clock, I'm pretty sure, or about midnight. So, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> we know how you feel after because we're up at one o'clock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, last few questions to wrap it up. Um, imagine, Mate, you were a director in a team and you were looking for riders to join your team, uh, young riders or, you know, under 23 or younger. What attribute would you be looking for specifically um, in a rider that you would like to bring on your team, a young rider? What's some, what's, you know, would you like, would you be thinking just all about their power or would you be thinking um their general attitude or whether they're a good team player or they have a specific quality about them what would you be looking for so i would take um to start with they need to have talent they need to be gifted physically to be able to to not necessarily in that moment have the power but to be able to that you see in them that they have the what it what you need to, to actually with training be able to reach a certain level, no? Yeah, yeah. Then moving on from that, if you need to choose from more individuals, because there's many individuals that have this physical ability, mm. uh, then I would strongly um, consider their personality. So how determined and focused and uh, perfectionist are they? Like if they are able to set high goals and if they are uh, yeah, willing to work hard to reach them, I would probably mm. observe their uh, work ethics and consistency over time. Mm. Uh, also speak with them to see what type of person they are, no? Because if they if you crack under pressure, then if you if your anaerobic threshold is skyrocket high, then doesn't doesn't help you, no? If you feel sick uh, the night before the race or if you can't sleep or or stuff like that. So uh mm. There's many things that are important. Also, uh, being a team player, um, the actual lifestyle of professional bike rider is not very simple. You need to make a lot of sacrifice in your private life to yeah. be able to do this job. You need to sacrifice late night parties, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, girls. Uh, <laughs> you need to be uh, away from your family most of the time, away from your parents. Some young guys now, they struggle to get away from their parents uh, when they are 18, 19, 20 years old. You are likely to have to move abroad to do your job properly. Mm. Mm. So these are all factors that you need to, to take in, into consideration. You need to be able to take care about yourself. You need to be able to wash your own clothes, to cook your own food. And you need to do it well to be able to do this job uh, mm. properly. Mm. You need to be reliable. Uh, so you need to to trust this individual to to actually take the flight and get to a race and be yeah reliable in person in general. Not all people are like that. So uh, yeah, many factors. There's not uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not easy to be a team manager. I think it would have its challenges for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. If you um you get a chance during the year to go out to a nice restaurant, right? somewhere local, maybe somewhere in Slovenia. What are you hoping is on the menu? What would you order at a nice restaurant? At any place, I always order uh, or try to find a restaurant uh, with uh, local specialties. So I like local food. Oh, I yeah. like to try different things. Uh, um, 
yeah, I I I always so, enjoy if yeah if they make traditional food from uh, ingredients that they get from yeah yes. farmers and locally in general. So I think yeah. that's the big oh. to go if you're in Poland to go to a Polish restaurant. If you're in Slovenia to go to a Slovenian restaurant. It's not always easy, uh, yeah. uh, but uh, it always works if you manage to find a nice place. What's a, what's a traditional uh, Slovenian dish that would be served at a restaurant in Slovenia? Uh, there's many. Uh, so Slovenia is a small but very diverse country. So our culture, our culture is a mixture of Austrian, so so to say the culture that you would normally find in the Alps because we are on the edge of it. Like I yes. grew up on the very edge of the Alps. Mm, mm. Then uh, with Italian influence. From the west also balkan influence from the south and uh hungarian influence from the east so we are kind of a mixture of all this and it brings up some very nice uh, dishes so oh, there's yeah. many local dishes that you can't find uh what would be in one international cuisine i would say what would be and one dish i don't know um my favorite in the summer is uh, filane paprika. So it's like uh, peppers that are filled with a um, mixture of ground meat and mm. rice Ooh. and tomato in a, in a served in a tomato sauce with uh, mashed potatoes on the side. Nice. Uh, I, I'm not sure where that's stolen, still, st where they steal that from, if it's from Hungarian culture or, or Alps, but uh, it's very tasty and good. Mm, I don't yeah. know if you can Stuff in the taste of in this moment, but it's like <laughs> yellow peppers, yeah, yellow peppers filled with, I didn't see that anywhere else. Always or yellow. Like, um, many dishes are based on potatoes. Right. And uh, local, yeah, local meat, meats of all kinds, potatoes, mm. uh, uh, cabbage, celery, uh, all the all the vegetables that grow on the ground, like beets or yes. uh, turnip, yeah, potatoes, carrots, uh, yeah, all, all those sort of things. Mm. Uh, Root so vegetables, it's quite, quite rich, and there's many dishes that are super good taste or even good for you as an athlete but it's uh italian cuisine is completely different we mostly use a mediterranean diet in, in cycling or sports in general because we think yes. it's the healthiest but some of the things that i make for myself at home are genuinely better for me than uh what is usual at races i would say hmm. well that's really interesting okay uh and finally a oh yeah when you've been to Australia quite a few times, I'm pretty sure uh, you've done quite a few. Yeah, you, you've done a few different races in Australia. You've done Herald Sun too. You've done everything. Um, when you, what do you think of like what? What do you think of Australia? Do you? I don't know. What do you think? I think it's uh, one of the nicest places in the world, with one big. Uh, 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 how you say exception uh, ec no exception or a, a bad thing uh, that it's on the other side of the world it takes like <laughs> a 36 hour flight to get there which it costs is. like two apartments in Slovenia you know like <laughs> this is an issue <laughs> like <laughs> you gotta blame blame the tectonic plates don't blame us <laughs> we're all like, once do you do you uh, remember uh, if you um, could at least build a bridge or something you know like <laughs> <laughs> have you have you do you remember what the big what the world was called when it was all one you know one uh, big uh, continent P Pangea uh but something on P starting with a P yeah uh, Pangea um, Pan Pangea I think yeah. yeah yeah so at one point we were all together <laughs> yeah that would have been more efficient that would be less good. pollution as well imagine the grand tour It'd take ages. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a grand, grand tour, you know? Yeah, super grand. Oh, Matt, hey, mate, thank you so much for um, your time. It was really interesting uh, getting to know you more, and I think everyone on this podcast will or listens, I think they'll have a new fan in you, mate, if they're not already, because uh, you've certainly been one of my favourite cyclists since you started uh, many moons ago now. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, mm-hmm. And looking forward to the World Championships in uh, in Australia in, you said, 2026, no? Yeah, in, it's called NANUP. It's in NANUP. NANUP. I will yeah. look it up. Maybe yeah. I come to do recon the year before. Oof. That will send shivers down the spine of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's going to be a big, big, big event in 2026. If you can pull off the win, uh, Merida will probably uh, award me with my own weight in gold then. Uh, Oof. Uh, I, think. I reckon. We got a lot of gold in in, the, in Australia, so yeah, good, good chance. Best of luck for your uh, Christmas time. I hope you get to spend some more time with your kids during Christmas, yes. mate, and um, have a great uh, season next year. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having mate. me. No worries. Take care. Yeah, take care. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye.